Welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Remco Mockfeld, as he said. Uh, I am based in Amsterdam and I work on Disney streaming services. Uh, at Disney Streaming Services, we do a couple of uh, apps for Disney and also other apps. We have an NHL app, Eurosports, and uh, a couple more. Uh, today, however, I will be talking about single activity by example. Uh, single activity is a pattern that Google has been pushing for in the past years. Uh, and I will. Uh, we, we, we decided to give it a try, and today I will be going through a couple of things that I found when we started using single activity by example, and actually uh, mostly fragment related. Like, I know it's a dangerous topic, but I really like fragments, and they are working out really well for, for us. Um, yeah, so why this talk? Uh, as I said, it works out very well for us, but when I, for example, tweeted about this uh, that I was going to present here, the first response was that until they fix backstack management, this is still going to be very painful. Another example I found online was that single activity doesn't scale and you don't, people don't get the hype and that big projects should be split up in multiple activities, one per feature. Uh, and last, that single activity often uh, creates spaghetti code because your code is not decoupled correctly because it's all in one activity. So yeah, the fragment backstack is an important thing and single activity, but this talk is called by example, so I have an example app uh, that is made and that's based off the NHL app that we have. Uh, when, the, when you open the NHL app, you first have to select a favorite team. Uh, once you do that, uh, you should log in. Uh, there's three login methods. Uh, one is with a Canadian telecom provider, you get free accounts. The other one is existing login. And there is a free trial that you can start. Here is a, like, it's very simple, a login screen. Uh, if you wanna start the free trial, you have to subscribe. It's, it uses the Play Store subscription API. And once you are subscribed, you will have to create an account. And if you did that, you'll get into a welcome flow, uh, which tells you that you can watch all NHL games live. And once you are through that, uh, you will get into the main uh, screen of the app. The main screen has a bottom navigation, which is like a very common pattern right now. Uh, the first tab is your your favorite team, the games. The second tab, uh, or the second tab is a scoreboard. And if you, you if you click on any match, you will get into a match detail uh, scoreboard, as I said, which lists all the match, all the teams, and a very simple settings screen, which uh, allows you to enable push notifications. All right. So now that we have that example set up and you kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's start off with fragment navigation. Uh, it's a very difficult thing, like the APIs have existed since Honeycomb, but uh, there are a couple of things that you need to n be aware of when doing fragment navigation, which I wasn't aware of when we started it, but quickly found out that you need to know that, and I would like to share that with you so that you will find that as well. First off, let's start with uh, what is a backstack. Uh, I am not a native English speaker, and honestly, I, for the longest time, I took this like a backstack as a concept, like one thing. Well, in actual proper language, it, it, it's not a, a real English word. The real English is two different words, and that's like a very important concept that at some point dropped for me. That is actually like a stack, and you can very much compare it with a stack of cards. Uh, where in a stack of cards, only the top app, or the top card is visible, which is the same with fragments. If you have a back stack, only the top fragment is visible. Uh, at the same time, like all cards in a, in a back stack exist, and the same is true for fragments. All fragments in the stack are actually in a created state. So they will go through on create, but they're like, they don't create the view and they don't go through on start. 
but they are in, on, on create. Like if you navigate away from one fragment to another, it will destroy the view, but it will not call on destroy. Uh, this is a very useful concept because like a lot of the the, the dependencies and uh, a presenter and stuff that you have will stay around, which is actually very much like uh, with activities, with the caveat that like activities or the, the advantage in fragments is that it does destroy the view. In an activity, it will not destroy the view when it's on the back stack. And that means that you are using more memory in your back stack, whereas fragments, the view is destroyed, so you're not using that memory. It's saved in the instant state, and it will restore once you get back to it. Uh, so yeah, that's the back stack. Uh, let's see how we build a back stack. Uh, we can have this simple code snippet. It uses, for those that are not familiar, uh, the Kotlin extension methods. Uh, and it will actually uh, not, n you, you will not need to do the begin transaction, repl uh, replace, and commit. That's all being done in this inline function. Uh, here you see, like, we first start with fragment A uh, in this case, and then we, re we add that to a container, and then we replace that with fragment B. Uh, let's take a look at what this stack looks like. So we have fragment A. It goes through onCreate. Uh, it goes through onCreate view. At that point on the left side, you see the current state of the fragment. So that's created. It goes through onCreate view. Next, it goes through on start, which causes it to go into the started uh, state, on resume, resume state. Uh, and next, we replace that fragment with, uh, with fragment B, but we keep it in the back stack. So what happens is B comes on top of A. Uh, fragment A will go through on pause, which m reverts it back to the started state. Uh, on stop, which will take it back to the created state on destroy view, which will cl clean up that view. And then it will stay in created, and y your next screen will go through on create, which gets created, on create view, on start, uh, which gets it to the started state, uh, on resume, which gets it into the resume state. And when we then press back, it will go through on pause, which gets to start it, on stop, Create it, undestroy view, then undestroy does get called because it gets popped from the back stack. We are no longer caring about that fragment, uh, and it it will be completely destroyed. And that brings it to the destroyed state. And at that point, your original fragment goes through uncreate view again. So you get you get the view. The, in this uncreate view, the saved instance state will be filled. So so you can store extra ex, extra state in there. Uh, on start, gets in the started state. On resume, gets it in a resume state. This is like the basic fragment API, but um, there's one thing if you want to build a back stack like this, like in some cases, uh, which we'll get to later, you actually want to build an artificial back stack. And in that case, if you do these two commits after each other directly, there will be a lot of uh, unnecessary view creation because your whole fragment A will create a view and that will directly be destroyed again. Uh, for this, a very important API in the fragment transaction is actually set reordering allowed. Uh, the documentation on that says that, are, that there are a couple of caveats on using that, but uh, I saw that Ian Lakes, uh, one of the uh, developer advocates at Google, actually said that um, it, you should almost always use this. Uh, and that looks like this. Uh, we have to set reordering allowed, set it to true. And next, let's look at all the state changes that are going to happen. Uh, I don't know if everyone can see it, but on the left you see the first transaction that happens. It, it's the, the black boxes are fragment A and the white boxes are fragment B. Uh, and if you have set reordering allowed, these two transactions will actually, because you don't commit now, but you use commit, they will be executed directly after each other. And by setting set reordering allowed, it will look at which uh, events actually cancel each other out. So 
on resume and on pause from the fragment A cancel each other out, so they will be removed. On start and on stop will cancel each other out, so they will be removed. On create, on create, on create view and on destroy view will cancel each other out, so they will be removed. So if you use this, it will actually fragment A will go through on create and then stop, and fragment B will then s directly start, and this way you can like completely do your uh, custom backstack building, which will come in very handy later. Uh, we can very quickly go through those states. So this is created on create, and then the second one gets created on create, on start, on resume, on stop, on destroy view, on destroy, and then if you press back, then your first screen will go, for go through on, on view create and on start for the first time. Uh, that's a, like the first important uh, method on that fragment transaction that I want to discuss. And the second one is the primary navigation fragment. Uh, this is also something that's being used very much in, for example, the navigation components API. Um, and it's actually like the primary navigation fragment. That's one of the, the main drivers for like having a the concept of an activity being replaced by the concept of a fragment. So everything you can do in an activity, you can also do in a fragment that has is the primary navigation fragment. Um, primary navigation fragment is a property on the fragment manager. So every fragment manager has one primary navigation fragment at any time. So if you replace the, the that screen, it will change the primary navigation fragment. If you pop the back stack, it will revert to the primary navigation fragment. Uh, this is currently what the app looks like. We have an activity, we have a splash screen onboarding fragment. The onboarding fragment hosts three other fragments, and you have the main app fragment, which also hosts three other fragments. So when we start the app, uh, splash is the main, the primary navigation fragment of the main activity. And when we finish splash, onboarding starts, and onboarding is the primary navigation fragment of the activity. And uh, favorite team selection is the primary navigation fragment of that onboarding fragment. Uh, you can walk through the entire app and there's like always one primary navigation fragment. Um, why we need this is that it's required for nested backstacks. Um, because backstack, the, 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 the pressing the back button should only be handled at one place at a time. Uh, you don't want two fragment managers to both pop a state if you, the user presses back once. So the the handling of the backstack should always happen depth first, which means like your your activity can first uh, try to ha uh, well, your activity will first check if its primary navigation fragment can handle it. Uh, if if that fragment has a primary navigation fragment, it will check that, and if that doesn't handle it, then you can go back up, so it's a, like a depth-first algorithm. Um, in the sample app, we have a very simple interface called back handling fragments. If a fragment is interested in handling uh, back buttons, it should implement that. And next, in ac in the main activity on backpressed, we call a method called handle backpress depth first. It's a very long method. It sh you should probably name it shorter. But um, for, for demonstration purposes, it has that name right now. Uh, and it will call that with its primary navigation fragment. If that primary navigation fragment is null, it means that the fragments don't handle it. Uh, and it, it'll, it will just return false. And then it will call super on backpress in activity. If there is a primary navigation fragment, it will first check that child manager primary navigation fragment. and. If that can handle it, or if that has, like, there, there is a recursive call, which you see at the top line that's highlighted now, uh, no? At line 10, it, it will call the handle backpress depth first on that child fragment, so that you, in that way you go depth first, uh, and you make sure that one fragment in the primary navigation uh, line handles it. If no fragments exist that handle it, it will re just return false, and super on backpress will be handled, which in uh, the standard case, we'll actually just pop the back stack. Uh, but as of yesterday, 
this was outdated. We had a speaker's dinner yesterday, and then when I checked back, Ian Lake mentioned on Twitter that the new alpha release of Android X got released, and they have a new API for handling uh, backpress, and that actually is it's called on backpress dispatcher. Uh, it's a lot easier API. I didn't. I, I did update the slides to have this, but I didn't get the time to actually discuss it. Uh, but I would definitely recommend checking that out if you uh, are interested in, in custom back behavior. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the two important functions on the uh, fragment transaction that I wanted to talk about. And next is actually in the sample app, we only have two functions defined for fragment navigation. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't do any, uh, well, in those two functions, we do fragment transactions, but otherwise we don't do any other fragment transactions. I would really recommend everyone to do the same if you start with fragments. And like the fragment transaction API is very complicated and very flexible, but in the end, you most of the time only want to have like few basic behaviors. The first fragment we have is just at the back stack, you pass in a container, it's an, it's an extension method on the fragment manager. Uh, you pass in a fragment and possibly a back stack name, and it will just do a begin transactions, replace, uh, add to back stack, set reordering allowed, and set primary navigation f uh, method, uh, set primary navigation fragment, and that's all it does. Um, and the second method actually uses that first method as well, and that says replace the back stack. What this does is it first pops the back stack uh, completely. And then it will ch take the root fragment, and it will add that without backstack, uh, without add to backstack, and then it will go through a uh, list of stack entries, which is a combination of, of a fragment and a back uh, and a tag, and it will add all of those to the stack. So, like in that case, you can build your complete backstack and have all those fragments go through on create only, and only your last one will actually be completely visible. Uh, if this is a bit confusing, don't worry, I'm gonna uh, share the link to the uh, projects later which uh, where you can look at all the code uh, in, in peace. Um, but yeah, th those are the, t the only two navigation functions that we have. Um, and that concludes the backstack, nav uh, the, the fragment navigation part of the talk. Next is the scalability, that was a concern. And I'm gonna put out a bunch of statements now which we'll get to later, uh, like why I think those are true. Um, in single activity, the activity is your single entry point of each app. So uh, you're, uh, yeah, you only have one activity that gets launched. Uh, fragments are this, uh, can be a single entry point for each feature. So you can build every feature in a fragment. Um, the advantage of this is that your activity actually presents a complete user session. So you can, if, if you want to have like foreground, background, or for example, for analytics, want to track foreground, background behavior, your on start of your activity is when it goes to the foreground, your on stop is when it goes to the background. You don't have to worry about multiple activities. There is a process lifecycle observer, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but um, it's, it's, it's much easier if you're a single activity because, yeah, it's just those two events. Um, and then fragments uh, are, can represent either individual screens or flows. Uh, in our example, the onboarding fragment uh, represents a flow because it will start screens below it. In, in some, like we are nesting fragments very heavily. We in in a production app that we have, we have like we go like four or five layers deep in nested fragments. Uh, and that works out very well. Uh, yeah, so that's the scalability part. I think like you can you can almost build an entire app in a single fragment. Uh, and there's actually an example in our onboarding in the onboarding app where it is an uh, an, an entire app. Uh, so let's take a look. The onboarding uh, flow has a uh, quite peculiar back behavior because it starts with a follow team fragment. 
Uh, next, you open that paywall screen, you select subscribe, you s uh, and at that point, uh, once you're subscribed, you actually don't want the, the user to go back to choose one of those other login methods. So at the, uh, it went quite quick there, but it's actually like once the user is subscribed, we want to replace our back stack. We still want them to be able to choose another favorite team, but we don't want them to choose between the login methods anymore because they've already chosen that. Uh, we can take a quick look at that again. Uh, no. Uh, but yeah, so the onboarding flow, it has a lot of different screens. It's uh, quite a complex back logic, as I said. It, and like according to those uh, original statements in the beginning, that would warrant an onboarding activity. Uh, but the onboarding activity is actually quite tough because you don't know what, uh, what, what's, what's coming next. Like once you're done with onboarding, if, especially if you are a feature, uh, a feature module based app, like providing the navigation to the next screen will then uh, require you to do some weird dependency injection. Uh, and whereas actually like we can have that completely in a fragment and the only thing we care about is whether onboarding is done. Uh, the structure looks uh, approximately like this. So you have onboarding fragment which hosts up to five different screen. And to use this in the app, we actually like only need to use that replace stack method with just the onboarding screen. Because we use replace stack, it will be the entire back stack will be popped, so pressing back will exit and you build up a back stack within that onboarding fragment. And second, we have that interface, uh, or we have an interface called onboarding host, and we make sure that the activity implements that onboarding host. Um, and what we, so we then at some point need to call that once the onboarding is done. For this, uh, I've seen a lot of cases where, and I did it myself in the past as well, quite often, where you then, in, on a touch of the fragment, you cast the activity to, an to that interface. Uh, this works sometimes, but especially once you go do that deeper navigation, um, it might not be the activity that implements it, it might be a parent fragment that implements it. So therefore, there is a function that we call find parent that implements, and you specify the uh, the, the type that you are looking for. This is an inline function uh, which uh, actually with a reified uh, type parameter so it can actually get that class instance. Uh, yeah, that's the onboarding host fragment and then we can use that uh, to find the interface. For this, this is the function I was talking about. Um, what it does is it checks if the parent fragment of the current fragment implements that interface. If it does, it returns it. Uh, next, it checks if there is a parent fragment. If there is a parent fragment, we want to find that interface in its parents. Uh, so it's, again, a recursive call. Uh, if the, that's not the case, um, we'll uh, check if the activity implements the interface, which is was in our case uh, the, the scenario. If it does, we'll return the activity. And the last option is if the application implements that interface, we'll return the application type. And if all else fails, crashes. Uh, this is actually, for those that are familiar with Dagger Android, this is exactly the same mechanism that Dagger Android uses to find uh, parents that can provide a subcomponent to inject its dependencies. And it's a very powerful uh, method uh, of like lo like a, a surface locator pattern, uh, which means that now the fragment can be used everywhere as long as one of its hosts implements that interface. Uh, but what about that custom back behavior? Um, if, if you remember correctly, we had a back stack of four, so the follow team fragments, uh, paywall, uh, subscription, and then the sign up. Uh, what we can actually do, instead of starting that sign up by adding to the stack, we can call the replace stack function, and we can go look in our, in our fragment manager and find that follow team fragment. Uh, we, we start it with a tag, and if that, if that doesn't exist, we'll just create a new one. 
but we can have that as the first entry or the, like the bottom entry of the stack. And if it is actually in the fragment manager, it's already in a created state. So um, you can build the entire back stack and it will never actually uh, get any lifecycle events because it's already created, it's already there. Uh, we're fine. It will just like remove those intermediate things from the back stack and add the new uh, sign up fragment. Uh, so that's a like that's uh, a very powerful way to like manipulate your backstack, and you have full control over your own backstack. Uh, it is sometimes a bit tricky because you don't exactly know when transactions are being executed. Uh, but so far, we like it, it, we we are not experiencing any problems with it. Uh, next up is that bottom navigation. Uh, the bottom navigation in the sample app is implemented al like almost according to the material IO spec. Um, it's a very difficult spec spec, like it's it's and it seems to have changed quite a bit over the past year. Uh, but this is actually the m the most recent behavior. Um, first of all, uh, you build a back stack within each tab. So if you are in a tab and you click on something, it will uh, launch that match detail and you, when you press back, it will go back. Uh, it goes a bit too fast to properly see, but um, let's go to the next requirement. I think you get it. the switching tab should reset the back stack. That's one of the requirements that they have. So if you are in the first tab, you go to the, ma to the detail screen, you go to the second tab and you press the first tab again, then it should uh, go back to the original state of that first tab. And that's what you see here. So we go into the detail, then we go to scoreboards, and then you see that item going back, and once you press home, it will re replace the entire back stack. Because the next requirement is that uh, or actually how Navigation Components implements it as well, is that back on the first tab closes the app. Uh, yeah, it's not a very exciting movie, but it's just pressing back and it will close the app. But pressing back on the second or third tab will actually um, uh, take you back to the first tab. Uh, this is not in the spec, but it is how the navigation components implements it, and it's we like we have found that it's the most the one that makes most sense uh, because otherwise you might like unexpectedly get people to get out of the tab, and the last one is that pressing the tab item while on the top level content will reset the tab to its original state. Uh, you see here, scroll down, press back, uh, or press home, and it will scroll up. Um, and actually, the implementation for this, when using that um, main uh, or when using that replace uh, tab frag stack fragment, is actually very easy uh, because we can again replace the stack. Like for uh, for the second and third tab, we can replace the stack with the what's currently the my team fragment or a new my team fragment, and add that new fragment, which is either sign up se settings or uh, scoreboards as as the backstack entry and then because it's like for the same reasons it will actually not touch that my team fragment to begin with but when you press back you will actually go back to the next team fragment uh, i see i'm running out of time but i just quickly want to handle the next uh bit and that's uh startup checks um it's that like we have quite a few apps where we need to be do startup checks which needs to be done on every startup uh, examples are to prefetch data or checking if a subscription has lapsed uh, or fetching an AB config. Uh, in the past, I've very often used in a multi activity window uh, uh, thing, I've used a splash activity. Uh, I, I searched GitHub public repositories on the word term splash activity, and there's 104K results in Java code, that does not include Kotlin code, which all have splash activity, so apparently I, I wasn't the only one. But there's a couple of problems with having a splash activity. First off, like if you are past that splash activity and uh, you background the app 
uh, forget about it. The user comes back three days later, but it's still like he doesn't use his phone very often, so it's still in the recents. If you press on the recents, it will actually re re go back to the last activity that it was on, so it will never go through splash activity. Uh, another thing that's very often is like if a splash, if the checks need to be done, we want to show the splash activity. But if they don't, if if, if everything is okay, we don't we don't want to show it. We want the user to go back to the app as soon as possible. Um, when you have a splash activity and it's like the launcher, uh, it has the the launcher intent filter, and you press the launcher, then it will always go through splash and start a new main activity, uh, or whatever your activity is called. Uh, which will al like always do that check. Um, when you are single activity on the other end, you can use your onCreate function uh, because whenever you go back from the back stack or anything, like in onCreate, it will your, your single activity will always go through onCreate. And in our example, um, we uh, have an onCreate function here. It will set the content view, then it will check if the saved instance states. Uh, equals null. So if if it if it isn't like oh, that's a very important one on fragments. Actually, if the saved instance state is not null, you almost never want to do a fragment transaction in your onCreate because the fragment manager handles its own state. And if you do a fragment transaction, you then replace that original fragment with what which is going to be restored with a completely fresh one with, which doesn't have any state. Uh, but so, yeah, we check if saved instance state is null, and then we have a, a count repository which is scoped singleton, um, which just keeps a reference to your current account. And if that is available, we can just start the app directly. We don't need to go through, or if, it, if that's not available, we'll go through Splash. And if it is available, we'll just start the app directly. The user will never uh, see a Splash uh, fragment, and that's like, it, it makes the experience so much better if you don't go through that splash. Like y y I'm sure you have seen it as well, where, the, where a timer is being set to show the splash, and then it's after two seconds, it launches the main activity. And if you back background the app before that, it will actually still launch the main activity because the timer is never canceled. If you have this, then you don't need to worry about that at all. Uh, that was it for most of the content. I now still have some key takeaways and tips, and that's that nested fragments are are good. Uh, they are a good thing, like if you are single activity, like nesting it is very good, like it allows you to do a lot of back stack behavior, um, which is very nice. And every UI feature can be built in a fragment. Uh, actually, in our case, in, in a sample app, the onboarding fragment uh, uses Dagger Android, and but it uses a slightly custom uh, dagger fragment, which means that it has its own dagger component, and it doesn't actually need to be a subcomponent of your parent. So it's like completely separate. You can plug and play it into any app. It uses full dagger, but it's not. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's really just starting the view. Uh, generally, if, fragments, if, if a feature becomes too big for a fragment, you'll split it up into child fragments, and that's where that nesting comes in. Uh, fragments should never depend on their host. Um, instead, fragments should depend on, uh, on their host implementing an interface that they define. Uh, always use the primary navigation fragments. If you're doing fragment navigation, like there are some headless fragments and stuff where you don't want to use the primary navigation fragment, but for everything else, you should. Always use set reordering allowed. Uh, and yeah, what I say, single activity and this fragment stack gives you full control over your back stack, and that's uh, very handy. Uh, and finally, some, some caveats related to fragments. What I said, only do initial navigation when safe instance state is null. A very important one is don't mix up fragment managers. A fragment has a fragment manager and a child fragment manager. Uh, the fragment manager is actually the, fra the child fragment manager of its parent or the, the fragment manager of the activity. And the child fragment manager is owned by that fragment itself. Um, basically, you almost never want to navigate on your parent's fragment manager. You just want to have that callback to say like, hey, I'm done. Do what do do the next thing, and then it's it's up to that parent to ha uh, to uh, control its child fragment manager. 
And the last one, which I really wanted to get out, but I didn't get the time to actually talk a lot about it, is that for navigation screens, either always use at the back stack or never. Uh, oh yeah, like I either always add to back stack or replace the entire back stack. That's it. So like you you don't want to have some primary navigation fragments being added to the back stack and others where you don't have that at the back stack, because that gets really messy. And if you have a, or if you first add fragment A, then you add fragment B. Uh, which you add to the back stack, and then you add fragment C, which you don't add to the back stack. If you then press back, it will actually never remove fragment C because it doesn't know about fragment C. It will remove the content from fragment B, which was already removed, and you'll get fragment A. And I think that's something that I saw a lot when before I knew about this, where um, you like you see like two fragments, the, or the views of two fragments in the same container. Uh, it's, it's a bug that probably everyone that worked with fragments has seen at some point, but it's very hard to track. Uh, and the very last thing is that, unfortunately, transition support in fragments, it's painful. Uh, it's, I know it's on the short list for Google to fix on fragments, like fragments were bad in the beginning, they, they fixed a lot of stuff, uh, but this is something that they didn't fix yet, and I, ho I have full confidence that they'll fix it soon, but hopefully at I.O. this year, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's it. And then finally, this is a link with the sample project. It's a fully modular project. It has some instrumentation tests. It has uh, like the whole fragment navigation. Uh, I'd recommend you to check it out. Uh, and that's it. <laughs>